Back to News Gang. The conversation has already begun, and I can see your questions as well on social media. We are so pleased to be joined tonight by the Cabinet Secretary in charge of health. That's Susan Nakumichawafula. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, a quick note you can send us your questions. The hashtag is News Gang. So, um, you know, we're now in the period of uh, public participation, just trying to get to understand this. I think for me, one of the things I would like to understand is what problem this solves, um, like what, how this works in terms of NHIF mm -hmm. that we are now phasing out now with this new fund. What was not working then that shift now comes in uh, to solve? In other words, what problem is it solving? How much better will it be? What gaps does it fill uh, from NHIF? Thank you very much, Yvonne and uh, Linus and uh, Sam. I'm happy to be here again this evening. At this rate, looks like I might just get on the payroll for <laughs> Royal Media Services. I hope, yeah. Hopefully, I perform well tonight. You have to deduct your shift. Completely shift deductions, yes. Yes, with shift deductions. Yeah. And make sure, please, you give me a good pay so that then it's a, a reasonable amount when it comes to deduction. Mm -hmm. So, thank you, Yvonne. What are we resolving? Is there a problem or there's no problem? There is a problem. So what are the limitations of the current NHIF that we want to resolve with the Social Health Authority? One, and I said it yesterday, structurally, NHIF was designed for salaried people, employees, so that it was based on a check-off of your payroll, that at the end of every month, there is a deduction that then goes into NHIF. Please note, we only have about 20% of Kenyans who are on payroll. The rest are not on payroll. So what does that mean? That it was meant to work for the 20% and not the 80%. While uh, you look at the Kenyan economy right now, I want to confidently say that it's actually being moved by the 80% in small and medium enterprises and other hustlers down there that are the ones who are running the economy. So they also deserve to be covered in uh, uh, healthcare. So one of the issues that uh, Shah is going to resolve is that we want to ensure that the 80% Kenyans now get into the fold of having medical insurance. That is issue number one. Issue number two, NHIF was designed the way the health system was designed, that it was curative in nature, in such a way that you have a Kenyan who has been contributing to NHIF for a whole year. When they get sick and they go for a low-level service outpatient, they're told, no, you cannot use your card, you can only use it as an inpatient. That means it was designed to cure. You must get sick. But here we have a case where we are saying most Kenyans... We want them now to access services at the primary level without necessarily having to be admitted, going to the secondary levels of services, that I should be able to walk into the dispensary, that is a level two facility next to me, get treated for malaria, and go back home using my card. So that is the other thing that we want to cure. The third issue that we would like to cure with the NHIF is that it was in itself a law that it was taking care of its uh, operations from the beginning to the end, that here I am as NHIF, I register persons, I collect their monies, I approve for them to be, for the services to be given, I approve for payment to be done. So like you're taking care of the whole process. But under SHA we're saying we introduce digitization, SHA will do registration, it will do a uh, collect uh, the, the premiums from individuals, but claims management we are going to outsource so that there's a third eye checking. Do you really require this uh, service? And if you do, then what is the rate? Three, uh, fourth issue is that NHIF was opaque. Mm -hmm. Opaque in what nature? That you are told, pay 500 shillings, but you're not told exactly what you're paying for. So under uh, so, so that you don't know, you know when you go and they tell you that your card is exhausted, you don't know exactly whether that is what you are meant to get or not. Under SHA, we are going to publish the benefits what we are calling a best benefit, what are you entitled to? So Kenyans are going to know what it is that they are entitled to in terms of treatment, in terms of diagnostics, in terms of even preventive, they should know. The uh, fifth issue, the problem with the NHIF, is that it did not look at completing treatment. For example, a patient, and uh, yesterday Sam, we were with you, you heard from the lady who had uh, breast cancer, that at some point she exhausted. Then you are told you have to top up Cash, you're told, Kadiako pesa nini? Imekuisha. Yet you have other sessions that you still need to take. So you are forced to get out of your pocket. Remember, like that lady yesterday, she gave an example of a patient who NHIF has paid up to 100,000. And now they are only left with 9,000 
to finish their treatment. But they can't because they don't have that 9,000 shillings. So it had uh, limits. In share, we are removing the limits. We are looking at a patient that you need treatment from the beginning up to the end. Then the other thing is exclusions. There are things that you'll be told they are not covered by NHIF. And you had yesterday blood works, for example, for cancer patients, they are not covered. NHIF, for if you have uh, a kidney problem and you need a transplant, the tests that are done before uh, a kidney transplant is done, they are not covered by NHIF, yet the procedure is covered. And then the treatment, the medicine that you need to use to ensure that then your body adjusts to the new kidney that you, you've gotten is not covered by NHIF. So you see those kind of limitations are the issues that we thought should now be addressed under social health authority. And that's why you see we've gone to the extent of having a whole new law, the Social Health Act, to address these uh, issues that I have uh, highlighted here. And the last issue, which is most important, in terms of premiums under NHIF, it looks like it was kind of a punishment to people who earn uh, the low income earners. If you are on uh, a mamamboga, you make maybe 3,000 shillings per month, you are being asked to pay a minimum of uh, 500 shillings. That's a very high percentage. If you are on a, on a, you, you earn 10,000 shillings, you are being asked to pay 500 shillings per month. That's about 5%. Look at somebody who earns a million. Their maximum payment in a month, currently in the NHIF, is 1,700 shillings. That is 0.1% of your income. That means that the person who is earning more is actually advantaged with the current NHIF. The person who is earning less is disadvantage, like you are being punished for earning less. So what we have done is then to introduce equity, that we introduce a, 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 a percentage that runs across, that you pay according to your ability or to your level of income. So Waziri, yeah. will there be a cap then on that? Because um, some, those who are earning 10 million will move from uh, contributing 1,700 to 27,500 shillings. Is, is there going to be a cap on, on this or no? Uh, so far, the regulations that we have put in place, we have not put a cap. But it's up to Kenyans. And that is why there's always public participation. You can never have a perfect law. You can never have perfect regulations. We subject it to public participation. The next two, three weeks, we are going to be listening to Kenyans, what they'll be telling us. You will be shocked you have some philanthropists. You know, they earn 10, uh, 10 million shillings. They pay 1,700 for NHIF, but when they go back to check their math at the end of the month, the number of relatives, the number of friends, the number of neighbors that they have had to contribute to their health care is much more than 27,500 that we are going to ask from them. So there are people who will say, okay, fine, so long as you make sure that then I do not get back to yeah. this WhatsApp's end. Okay. In line with that, and, and then I'll you know, just let others, because there have been uh, numerous cases of corruption mm -hmm. and collusion with the funds at NHIF. Yes. There's been failure to reimburse hospitals to the extent that many of the hospital associations are now declining NHIF cards. Mm -hmm. And this has all been with the contributions that we've been having so far under NHIF, which is 1,700 or 500, which was the voluntary for those um, you know, who are not working. So there's been corruption already with the 1,700 shillings that is being uh, given. You are now asking for over 20 times that amount. In what way have you safeguarded uh, the Social Health Insurance Fund? Because now you're asking Kenyans to fork out more money. And yet with the little that we have seen with NHIF, there have been massive cases of corruption. So what assurances are you giving Kenyans that it won't just be more money in the pot for those who have um, evil intent to just steal more? Uh, that's true, Yvonne, that we've had a lot of uh, things that are not right at NHIF. We've had massive revenue leakages at NHIF. Remember I said earlier that NHIF was a law unto itself that you collect, you, you determine the rate, you, 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 you collect the money, you are the one who, uh, you, you authorize the, the, the patients or whoever needs to do maybe a surgery or something like that, you again pay. So that system was uh, in such a way that it was, uh, it was, it, it allowed for people to play some monkey business with the system. That we have, we have employees. Sorry, CS, to cut yes. in, because you're using mm -hmm. very soft words. Mm -hmm. You're talking of leakages. Yes. You're, you're talking <clears throat> of monkey games. Can we call it correctly theft yes corruption? yes we've had theft in nhif we've had corrupt uh, people in nhif we have facilities that are uh, that are uh, fraudulent it's it's both in 
and out of NHIF. We have hospitals that you, a hospital has one theater, but they claim to do seven surgeries in a day. So you wonder how do they do those surgeries? But do you need this new law? Why not just catch the thieves? Because we already have a law that catches people who steal public funds. It has not been adequate. But again, the most important thing that we are introducing this is that social health authority is 95% digitized from the point of registration up to service provision. Remember, again, we are going to outsource claims management. So administratively, NHIF has issues. And that's why, for me, I said, we do not have to keep patching up NHIF. Why don't we just get a new thing that speaks into that that we want to do? You know, you know what you're saying, CS, and, 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 and let me use the illustration of vehicles. Maybe we were driving a pickup, but now you're saying, no, give me a Mercedes Benz. Yet, the pickup has been crushed so many times. Instead of addressing the driving skills, which is the administration, we are saying, no, no, just give us a new thing. Give us Schiff, uh, because we crushed NHF, but we might drive Schiff better. No, no, no. That is being very simplistic, Kai Kai. I've said, one, the fundamental change that we are doing with our healthcare is that we are moving from focusing on curative to preventive and promotive. That as a country, we have been anticipating people to get sick. That they get sick, we provide services. The other so like even what yes, we have yes. gone into. The big anticipation here is this money will be stolen and there'll be not, it will not be accounted. Much of it will not be accounted. The other day you had a press conference, you spoke about the 20 billion shillings lost through NHIF, through fake surgeries, fake hospital claims. Look, what would stop now the bulk of this money, that, and it's, it's coming in as a lot, because for those who earn a million shillings, 27,000 shillings, that's quite a lot to be stolen. It is, leaders, and I have told you the things that we are doing to introduce efficiency into the system. One is that if you look at, uh, I have said the theft is both in and outside. If you look at the transitional clauses under social health authority, I am not transiting my staff at 100%. I'm going to do a suitability test to see who is it that can transit. We have disciplinary cases. For those I'm sure by now they know themselves, they know that oh, we shall not transit. We have people who are just there for the sake of being there. They are not diligent in their job. Those people are not going to transit. But we have very good staff as well who know what they're supposed to do. Those people will transit. Problem number one resolved inwardly. We do not have a system at the moment. That the system that is there has allowed people to be able to manipulate it to approve surgeries. Do you know, you will be shocked that for a very long time, for many years, NHIF has had one approval. That when that person is on leave, and most of the time, they even tend to go and live abroad. They will go with a the password. They'll be approving surgeries from abroad. Can you imagine what sort of institution we had? So those are some of the things that we want to change. <coughs> that then we introduce efficiency, we put in a digital system that takes care of registration, takes care of claims management, and furthermore, Kenyans know what it is that they are being charged for. And, and Waziri, you said that you're going to outsource claims management. Mm -hmm. How will you do that? <coughs> uh, we plan to have uh, an integrated health management information system that once you have done uh, registration, by the way, we are going to get rid of paper in our health facilities. Mm -hmm. So that if a patient is moving from one level of service to another, then it's through the system. Yours is to walk to the other level, or if it's an ambulance, then you are driven to the other level of service. But meanwhile, the, uh, the, documentation will be, the documentation will be moving through the system from one level of service to the other. That then we are going to have uh, uh, an, uh, a company that is good at claims management. You know, we have private insurances that do very well when it comes to managing their claims. So then we have an, uh, a company that uh, is uh, regulated by the insurance regulatory authority that then just verifies claim, looks at a prescription and says, okay, this was the prescription or this was the diagnosis. This is the treatment that has been done. Does it match or not? And then what is the value of payment? We have a prescription in terms of a benefit package. We have defined how much malaria is going to cost. We have defined how much a test is going to cost. We have defined how much a certain surgery is going to cost. So for them is to look against the tariffs that we have put in place and see that they match before payment is done. And even as you do that, uh, you say that you're going to deal with uh, the rot that was at NHIF. 
and sure you will because you have to do a fresh recruitment for a social health authority. Mm -hmm. But the managers of these hospitals that are still laying these false claims or exaggerated claims, they remain, especially if you're talking about the private sector hospitals. So how will you deal with that, even if you are to procure a claims management firm? Uh, one other thing that we are doing, uh, you know, it's a whole landscape that we have uh, put facilities into what we call a primary care network. Under a primary care network, all facilities are going to be linked, be it public facilities, faith-based facilities, or uh, private facilities. They're going to be linked into the, that primary care network. We are going to ensure that each facility, on the minimum, has a tablet to be able to do registrations online, to be able to do their referrals online. Two, we are going to have a criteria that immediately we finish with regulations, we are going to onboard facilities. So the, we are going to take them through a criteria of checking, do you have one, two, three, for you to be onboarded to be able to provide services under the Social Health Act. Mm. Yeah. And before, Lina, there's a point you spoke about that it's Kenyans who are going to tell you whether you need a cup or you don't. Let's talk about public participation. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you heard what happened with the Finance Act of 2023. A lot of feedback that came from members of the public, uh, specific on the housing levy mm -hmm. that you and I are paying today. And the feedback, almost 90% was saying, we don't want it. But then that didn't matter when it came time for Parliament to make a decision. So why would we look at you and believe that it's going to matter whatever feedback Kenyans tell you uh, specifically on that question of capping, whether they like it or they don't? Uh, one sum, we have uh, demonstrated that we adhere to processes and uh, we adhere to the law. You see, if we were people who would not uh, pay attention to adherence, when the court suspended our issues, we would have continued in the background, but we stopped. And we went and pleaded our case then the merit, our, our, our case was listened to, and based on merit, we were uh, given, uh, the, the suspension was lifted. When it comes to public participation, it is a, a multi-stakeholder uh, kind of public participation that we will call the forums, yes. We will call the leaders from these places. Actually, we are going to go region-wise. Mm. Uh, according to the COG, they have grouped themselves in some uh, economic region blocks. That is what we are going to go by. We are also going to use our current NHIF regional offices up country that we collect information. In a public participation exercise, once you finish, you have to sit down to do your report. But once that report is done, the report is given to the committee on delegated legislation. Mm -hmm. It is the work of that committee to verify that this is what you went out to public participation, this is the feedback that you received, have you taken care of it or not? <coughs> so there's a third eye from parliament. They are the ones to check and say, okay, you received this in terms of feedback. Did you comply or not? So we will not proceed until so we so get you'll, approval. You'll make, you'll make amendments based on the feedback? Yes. Was there, on 13th of September, I spoke to you in the same studio and mm -hmm. you told me that uh, uh, there was a cap of 5,000 that was being introduced. When I spoke to you almost about two or so months later, you said there's no cap. Mm -hmm. What changed in between? Uh, Sam, and by the way, at some point, I thought you were getting so personal on that matter. <coughs> when I was here in September, we were talking about an amendment to NHIF Act. And in that amendment, our proposal was 5,000 shillings. Now, this is a new law. <coughs> Remember, we had done amendments and gone up to the end. We were, we, we were actually going to publish the amendments to NHIF Act. So we had proposed 2.75%. Remember, this had even been done previously, mm. and there was a court, a court case by a Federation of Kenya, uh, FKE. And that is what brought about the 2.75% with a cap of 5,000. We dropped the NHIF amendments. Now we have the Social Health Act, a new law. That is what changed. The law changed. Yes. Venus. Yes, yes, I'll still go back to my uh, <laughs> uh, uh, pet issue, which is the, the, the low, uh, low trust that the public has mm -hmm. with uh, these mm -hmm. contributions and uh, handling of this money. So they, they are scarred by history, you know, the scandals that uh, are not just um, uh, at NHF, but the Ministry of uh, Health. You remember the Afia, Afia House come before you came to government. How do you intend to plug that gap of trust because I hope you are aware that the levels of trust are really low. Uh, I hate you say the level of trust are low, <coughs> but do we stay condemned forever? Do you want to tell me that uh, Ministry of Health, which is Afia House, remains Mafia House forever? 
No. Even when somebody is put behind bars, there's a time when their matter is listened to <coughs> and they're given a clean bill of health. For me, who is a Catholic, once I go and do my confessions and the priest listens to me, he says, your sins are forgiven, and I move on. So we cannot, remain, we cannot <laughs> remain condemned so. forever. Here we are, and we are saying, this is a new ministry of health. And we have a plan. At least we know what we are doing. <clears throat> we have clarity. For example, when we say that pay, you will get services. People should be asking me, what have you done to ensure that those services are available? And that's For example, yeah. when uh, at the moment... And when we came into office, the fill rate, the availability of drugs at Kemsa was at 28%. That a county would ask for 100 uh, items or supplies, they would only be given 28 out of the 100. Last year, we went into a drive of local manufacturing and try and recapitalize <coughs> Kemsa. We have moved from 28%, we are now at 68%. So for sure I know that once you go into the facility closest to you, you will find drugs. Number two that we are doing is equipping. We already had uh, a program, you remember the program that was there for uh, managed equipment services that looked at curative level, high level equipment, which went into counties. But for us right now, the proposal that we have had and that we have had discussions with the Council of Governors, we have agreed next week we are going to tender, <coughs> is to look at what are the equipment requirements for the low level facilities. That is dispensaries and uh, that is level two, which are dispensaries and level three health centers. We have a plan to equip them. Our plan number three is to look at the ratio. Our ratios currently for human resources for health are bad. And that is where we shall move to as third level. We have done the best. We, had, we are doing equipment. Once we finish with the equipment, we fill the gap on human resources. And let me tell you, many people move from one facility to another because they went, they didn't find <coughs> drugs, or they went, the nurse was missing, or the doctor was missing, or they went and a machine was missing, or equipment, they were told to move elsewhere. If we make this available, at the lowest level of service, at the dispensary, people will be able to access services. And let me tell you the gang that managing level two dispensary is the easiest. Mm. For example, in December, I was in Tanzania, where I come from, <coughs> in a dispensary called Kimondo. Their, their monthly requirement for pharmaceutical is 300,000 shillings. 300,000 shillings. But as of December, they were out of stock. So if we just focus, and ensure that all the dispensaries that we have, which we have about 9,000 of them in the country, have drugs, which we need to spend only 300,000 per dispensary, people will be able to get facilities at the nearest level. And number two, it will also encourage people that they will not sit so much with sickness <coughs> to a level that now they go mm. to seek health care when it is advanced. Yeah. Mm. They'll be able to seek it early enough. We shall be able to manage it at the bottom. Now, now CS, you know very well that you can be trusted with big things only if you've demonstrated a very good ability with small things. And you speak of equipment. And I just want you to set the record straight with this medical equipment leasing project, um, which we saw the national government running out of steam, basically, uh, because I think it was at the beginning of 2023 that you, know, you now decided to get the private contractors to now deal with the uh, uh, county governments. And I think the other day you had um, uh, another amendment to the same uh, process again. Your staying power itself is a problem uh, when it comes to some of these very good things. <clears throat> you know, Linus, we came and inherited the managed equipment services. I do not want to go into details. What I can tell Kenyans is that we overpaid for those equipments. That I can confirm to Kenyans. So what did we do? Immediately we said, we are not going to proceed with these contracts as they are. So those contracts were terminated, or we terminated at the ministry under my regime. So now we have gotten into a new arrangement. Remember, some of those uh, <coughs> equipment are life-saving. For example, a patient who is on dialysis. As much as I have terminated the contract with the vendor because it is lopsided, this patient still needs dialysis. So we have gone into fresh negotiations. And we did a joint negotiations between the Minister of Health and representative from COG, including the chair of COG and the chair of health committee. They sat in that discussion we were having with the vendors and saying, can we have value for money? You are providing dialysis. How much is a dialysis costing? So how much are you charging us? We have had those discussions. So the extension of the, the new contracts that we are going into, which is service and maintenance, is for six months that the national government is going to take care and make payments uh, for January to March, and then after uh, March to June, 
uh, the county governments will take care of them. But these are <coughs> negotiated terms for service and maintenance only. Uh, Waziri, let's take you to the regulations themselves. And there's a paragraph that says that upon attaining the age of majority, a beneficiary becomes an independent household and they should make a contribution. The same regulations say that once you hit 25 years of age, you're unemployed, you're living with a contributor, you should be registered as an independent um, household and you must contribute a minimum of 300 shillings. What is that? People turning 18, people turning 25, what is that? There are two issues there. <laughs> Uh, in Kenya, you are regarded as an adult once you attain the age of 18. So what is going to happen is registration. By the way, in the regulations, we will register people at birth, just the way you get a birth certificate, so that then you are a child member to social <coughs> health authority. Mm -hmm. But when you attain the age of 18, then you become an adult. It is not SHA that is putting that in place. It is there. Mm -hmm. in the country. You get your identification at 18. So then you get registered at uh, 18 years. But now we have people who are 18, yet they are students. They depend on others. We anticipate that at least by the age of 25, you should be done with your schooling, with your college or whatever it is, so that then you stop being, uh, uh, you, you stop being a dependent to your guardian or to your parent, then you start your own payments. So that is what happens at 25 years. Now we are going to go into registration. There are people who will not have attained 18 when we begin in March, isn't it? So when they get to 18, we will register them. There are people who are 25 as at, uh, when we begin in March, and they have now moved out. They are no longer students. So they begin payments. So, so I, I, sorry, I have a follow-up question to that mm -hmm. because someone asks, what happens to parents who have disabled children who are over 26, are unemployed, <clears throat> and currently under NHIF, do we now have to pay for them? That's a question from someone on Twitter. What happens in that instance? Uh, if they are disabled, it means they, they, still de they largely depend on the parent. Yeah. So that is a case that will be handled on a case-by-case -case basis. And by the way, we have, uh, in this Social Health uh, uh, Act, we are going to pay for indigents, and the other category that the government is going to pay for is for those who are disabled or severely disabled and they are not able to engage in any income generating mm -hmm. activity or they are not able to make any income, the government is going to pay for them. Okay. Yeah. Maybe just clarify there, um, the question of age, because if an individual shall within 90 days apply for registration, registration as a contributor and as a household, separate from the parent's household, but now you're also saying that they have to wait until they are 25, by which time it's assumed that they have finished schooling. Please clarify that. Is it a confusion or there's, a, there's certain information that is informing that, uh, that provision? There's no confusion, Sam. There are people who will attain 18 and they are independent on their own. They even may be starting families at the age of 18. And there are some that won't. And there are some that won't because they are a student. They have a student ID. They are continuing with, the, with, the, with lessons or classes. They still depend on their parents. Those are the people we are saying then will go up to 25 years. But if you are 18 and you, own, you are on your own, you even maybe want to start a family at 18 years, you cannot still be under your parent, and therefore you expect to register and make your own payments. Um, there's another question here from um, Jeremiah Karyuki who says, um, on, on the 2.75%, it's quite easy to get those from those with pay slips, but for those earning high incomes in businesses and self-employment, how do you expect to deduct given even Kerry has a challenge on tax data? Uh, there is a challenge, <coughs> but we have developed a tool, a means testing tool, to be able to analyze the uh, incomes, to determine estimates of incomes, and that is what we are going to rely on. We, we, you, you know, like uh, education, Ministry of Education, mm -hmm. they have used a means testing to determine the levels of bursaries that they are going to give students. So it is not going to be unique to us. We shall use the same tool, maybe an improved version of it, so that we, we, we are able to determine the incomes. But remember, we have, uh, you know, this is our one government. <coughs> we have Hustler Fund. There are people who have onboarded on Hustler Fund. And for the for, for Hustler Fund to determine how much you can borrow, it is based on your income. Mm -hmm. 21 million Kenyans. I'm told actually 23 million Kenyans by now are on Hustler Fund. So, and actually even in uh, SHA, we want to also leverage on that. That should you not be able to pay for your SHA <coughs> right away, 
you can borrow money from Hustler Fund and pay for your premiums. Okay, I mean, I think uh, the means testing is understood in terms of determining, um, you know, how much people are making and therefore how much they should pay. Mm -hmm. I guess the idea is on uh, collection or enforcement, and I think that's what Jeremiah is talking about, um, which even carry in terms of trying to expand the tax bracket. They know how many SMEs we've got in the country. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I just, I think the question is, how are you going to be able to okay. collect the money and to deduct that? You, you know there's X number of small businesses, this is how much they're making, but if an organization like KRA is having a hard time collecting that money, what means do you have to go out there and, and get what's owed to you under Schiff? Yvonne, unfortunately, <clears throat> that's the challenge of our society and of our community that people have to be pushed or there has to be a, a mechanism of enforcing, yeah. you know? So uh, what we had done in our acts, one, we had said that uh, at every point of service, you should be asked to produce your, your share registration and equally uh, show that you are paid up. Unfortunately, the court. that is one of the sections that the court yeah. said, no, the no, 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 no. That out. this one you're going too much. So administratively, then we are going to look at how is it that then we, we ensure that people pay up. But it, well, in it's that case, isn't it really? then the same as NHIF? Because that's what you said was one of the challenges with that in terms of getting more people um, onto the fund to contribute. But if now you're again saying there's going to be a challenge in terms of collecting that from non-salaried uh, Kenyans, then doesn't it just go to the same thing, which was NHIF targeting salaried Kenyans because it's easier to deduct the money at source? Then aren't we just back to square one with what you're saying in terms of enforcing and, and ensuring collection? We have uh, tried to put in other mechanisms of where collection can be done. For example, farmers <coughs> who belong to a society and they get dividends. We want to ensure that then at the point when the dividends are paid, they pay for their premiums for health care once a year. People who are on Hustler Fund, we, sh we, we, we think if we were to tie together with Hustler Fund to the extent that if you are to borrow, borrow, but the first thing that ought to pay for is your premium for health. So we are trying to put in mechanism and you can see is that, we were right. Is a regulation needed for that? Well, well mm. uh, actually, when you look at the regulations, they sort of speak to that because it says <laughs> that uh, the social health authority, the cooperatives and MSME ministry mm -hmm. and other financing institutions will provide premium financing to non-salaried persons. But can you force people to take a loan to finance their premium? Mm. Well, are people forced to opt into Hustler Fund? They're not. They do that voluntarily. They do it voluntarily. But they borrow to build their businesses, not mm. to borrow to pay, to pay premium yeah. for a shift. It's true, to build their businesses. But they run into a risk. We are also going to do a lot of education to members that they run into a risk. Today, if they felt sick and they're not able to get treated, they'll not even be taking care, take care of that business that they want to do. So we are going to do a lot of uh, education to Kenyans. And I want to plead with Kenyans. It is better to pay your insurance than wait until you get sick. It is much more expensive. Well, was it for sure? That is true. <clears throat> it is indeed true. I can tell you for free because I have experienced it. Mm -hmm. But business entity and the person are different. That's what manners mm -hmm. of business mm -hmm. teach. Mm -hmm. So that you separate yourself from the business entity. Mm -hmm. So that you don't borrow from a bank to mm -hmm. come and build your business, but you're eating from it. If you borrow from the Hustler Fund, you're a Boda Boda rider. You're building your Boda Boda business. When you're asked to borrow to pay your health premium, or health insurance premium, that is mixing the person and the business. How do you plan to succeed in this? Uh, Sam, the people who borrow on Hustler Fund are not the people that you are describing in terms of a separation between them <coughs> and their business. They are the business themselves, a Boda Boda rider. And actually, a border border rider needs insurance more than anybody else because even the business itself has its own risks and it is the rider himself. So they are not separate from the business. You know, when you talk about businesses that are separate from individuals, are big corporations like Royal Media. It's an entity different from the owner. But when you come to a Mamamboga, it is either that Mamamboga going to the market to buy the Mboga, come and sell. And therefore, even in the course of just uh, being able to move from the market to anything can happen. So they are more exposed to risk vis-a-vis -vis the kind of business that you are trying to describe. And majority of Kenyans are in those small businesses where it is themselves. If they are not there, the business is dead. If they are not there, you cannot tell somebody, please ride my Boda Boda for me. And then you bring my... It, is, it doesn't happen. It is you, the business owner, and yourself. So you have to take care of yourself. By the way, 
in the Moy Teaching and Referral Hospital, we have a whole ward dedicated to people who, uh, to border border riders, who get involved into in accidents each and every single day. So we are working together with the Ministry of Transport in terms of providing education, but they are going to be one of the biggest beneficiaries of this social health authority. Just a couple of questions from uh, Stacey <coughs> Chepkemoi. Um, the first question, she says, initially private companies would pay a monthly contribution to NHF. Uh, what platform does the SHIF have to cover that? Do you still have that? No. Under the Social Health Authority, it is a best cover for everyone. For once, the president and the Mamamboga are going to have the same cover. But should you need additional? Should you need hospitality? For example, and I gave this case uh, yesterday, uh, Sam, mm -hmm. that you can be treated malaria at the dispensary next to you. But should you decide you don't want the dispensary next to you, you want to go to a high and <clears throat> private facility, then you are expected to mix the difference. As social health authority, we'll pay the, uh, the one that we have defined. If we have defined that it is 500 shillings, we'll pay 500. If you go to a high-end facility, uh, uh, facility where you will be treated well, where there's a very high level of uh, hospitality, where you are maybe welcomed with a bouquet of flowers, you will pay for those flowers, the extra cost from your pocket. But again, us having the best cover for all Kenyans does not stop from private employers getting additional cover for their employees. It doesn't stop them. Let me take you back to the question of uh, contributions. Yesterday I asked you the question, how soon you expect it to take effect? And you said you're hoping that by 1st of March mm -hmm. the regulations are in effect. Yes. And I asked you, how about the contributions? You said hopefully the same month. I look at the regulations and they are saying that um, upon the regulations coming into effect, meaning they have been published by the ministry, there will be a window of 90 days to allow for Kenyans to apply for registration. Yes. And that's why I was asking the question. So if the registration is taking 30, I mean 90 days, the sort of registration you've seen in this country is registration of voters. IBC calls out, people can register. After that, there's cleanup, then there's verification, then there's publication of the voters' register. Of course, you may not need to uh, publish, but I don't know what the systems are like. But do you foresee a situation where you publish the regulations, you register people, and you start the contributions the same month? Uh, you know, it will, it will uh, depend. Once we register you, then you expect that you start payments. But the, uh, if we haven't registered you, then we don't expect that you you start your payments. So we are going to have uh, various points of registration at different service levels. We are going to enable uh, or make it possible for Kenyans to get registered. Actually, we are working to have a system that you self-register yourself on your mobile phone so that we take the shortest time possible to register. But should there be a case where we have not registered somebody, then we don't expect that they start payments. And then that would be unfair because ideally mm -hmm. it would be a requirement for every employee to be registered so that even the deductions, the check of deductions can be made immediately. Mm -hmm. But those in the non-salaried sector, the informal sector and others uh, in, that are not employed, it is almost voluntary it appears because already the court has suspended that requirement that every person must, but you start collecting and the benefit is the same for everyone. So if the employed, the deduction begins in March, for those others, they may come then near December or near November, but the benefit is the same in December? The benefit is the same, but you will not be able to access services. If you, I register you in March or you self-register yourself in March, then we get your deduction at the end of March. Then you are able to access services almost immediately. But if somebody does not get registered, by maybe up to April, they are not registered, it's expected that then they will not be able to access services. Yeah. And remember, insurance is to, 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 to take care of a risk. Nobody knows when they will get sick. So for me, it's to encourage Kenyans that the earlier you register yourself, the earlier you begin payments, the better. So that then you are able to access services. But, but how do you manage that? Because NHF is running until November, unless I'm mistaken. How do you retire? When do you retire it? Uh, by the way, as we speak now, it stands repealed. So what is happening now is social health authority. 
It's just that we have not uh, finalized the mechanisms of onboarding. But NHIF, what it is doing at the moment is winding up. The processes that need winding up. But immediately from March, once we have uh, done registrations, we have started payments, that will be Social Health Authority. It will not be NHIF. But the benefits will be based on what? S S S SHA or NHIF? SHA. Okay. okay. Waziri, I like mm -hmm. optimism, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I, I want you to just look ahead and just tell us mm -hmm. what is that one thing that can go so horribly wrong about this transition? Uh, one uh, is that I know there are going to be pitfalls along the way. This is something new that we are introducing. Even with the system, you've all seen where systems fail. So we will uh, be able to, to move and overcome the pitfalls that may come by. But otherwise, we have planned to ensure that there's a smooth transition in terms of uh, uh, registration of persons, in terms of having the system in place to collect payments, in terms of the services being provided. We actually have a transitional committee that we have put in place. Also to ensure that there's smooth transition to see what do we move fast, what moves last. That is just to ensure that we have a smooth one. But should there be issues, we have the Social Health Authority Board that is in place, it should be able to oversee. This transitional committee is going to oversee. We still have even the NHIF board that is now playing a role in terms of assisting SHA. So we have three boards really to speak that are going to ensure that uh, things go right. But I don't want to say that uh, we, nothing might go wrong. Something can go wrong, we'll deal with it as we move by. And one of the things that can go wrong, Waziri, is money can be stolen, deductions can disappear. And uh, one of the questions that is really persistent uh, right now from uh, our viewers watching this is, there were no prosecutions at NHIF, and what assurance do you uh, give in terms of measures that will protect these deductions mm. from people who may uh, appeal for that? I, I have told you, Kekai, that we are going to do a very rigorous exercise in terms of determining who works at NHIF. The system that we are going Sometimes to... Sometimes it's not even about who works. The system that we are going to deploy... It's about the suppliers, about... The system that we are going to deploy, we have confidence in it. It is not a system that we are doing a trial and error. It has been tried and tested in other countries. It is working. We have many countries that are running their health care based on this system. We have many countries that have already achieved universal health coverage. We will not be the first. So we know the pitfalls that are likely to be there. We have planned for it. But, you know, I'm, I'm not Jesus. I'm, I'm, I'm promising the best. And I would like Kenyans to give me the benefit of doubt that let them allow us to do this job and hold us accountable at the end of the day. And just for clarity again, is the system going to be outsourced or will it be run and operated by SHA? Linus, I am a believer in outsourcing. You do what you do best. As a ministry, we can now not start saying we want to run news. We just leave it to Royal Media Services. The system is outsourced so that we get the best out of it. It's just the same thing with equipment. The one I've told you that we are trying to get into a new arrangement. The government is not going to buy any equipment. It is the equipment vendors who are going to place their equipment, run their equipment, but provide the service. It, so for us, no, we are going to provide the service. Yeah. Yeah, we're not going to run a, a system by that, ourselves. That we've got very clear. The system will be outsourced. Yes. How will the service provider be picked? Who will that, that will run that system? And how are they selected? We have a procurement laws within the country that allows uh, different procurement methods. We have, uh, it can be single source based on the magnitude. And this is, you can imagine a system that is going to run the country. Not many people would have capability of such a system. So we have looked at the best in the market and asked them, can you bid for this process? The so, best so in the market. It's not here yet? No, not yet. Who's not procuring yet. it? Sure. Now, last year in November, you gazetted three members of the Social Health Authority. The president gazetted the name of the chairperson of the authority. Yes. The PS Health, PS National Treasury are supposed to be there. Mm -hmm. But there are certain members of that board that are not in office yet. Yes. Can they procure now? Yes. The board has a quorum. The so, board has a quorum. We have the chair. We have uh, two independent members so far. 
one representing the caucus of CECs from the counties, one representing the faith-based uh, facilities. We have the Director General of Health who sits in that. We have uh, our PS uh, Medical Services sits there. We have the PS Treasury who sits there. That is already a quorum. The people who are missing, I think, are three. Mm -hmm. persons who are missing and tomorrow we are gazetting two of the three that are missing okay i, I was going to say that um, already mm -hmm. from the list that you mentioned there it's government heavy mm -hmm. they're the ones that are going to do the procurement but is it them do they have a ceo now yes social health authority now has a ceo uh, the board met uh, i think it was the beginning of this week and they appointed the the current nhf ceo as the acting ceo acting ceo yeah but you don't have the staff we do not have staff, but we have a secretariat. So one of the, and that is why I've said we have a, a transitional committee in place. It is going to develop a, a roadmap in terms of transition, what begins. They are going to tell us, because you see for a new organization, they have still to develop their instruments of HR. Based on their instruments of HR approved by SCAC and Public Service Commission, that is when they'll go into active recruitment. Okay, and I'm asking this because we are just near the end of January and the start of February, and you're hoping that by 1st of March, which is in the next just over 30 days, mm -hmm. you'll have this running. You don't have the staff. You don't know how many staff members you need. You don't know how many of the NHF staff you need to retain because they have to apply and the suitability test has to be carried out so that you decide how many you're keeping, how many you're losing, and also you're going to recruit from outside. You have not procured a claims um, management uh, firm. How then can you promise Kenyans that this is going to be possible starting March if that's when the regulations are, are, are ready, yet you know Parliament is still in recess? Uh, Sam, we started working from the day we realized that NHIF is not working. So many of the things we have been working on, for example, the system, it is not being customized, you know? It's a system that is working in other places. So deployment is not difficult. And we are working with these people from when we discovered that we need a change in this. We have been looking at what works in the market. In terms of staff, I've said that 95% of social health authority is digitized. Therefore, to mean that we do not need the same number. In NHIF right now, we have 1,860 employees. I can tell you for a fact, we do not need 1,860 in SHA. We have a CEO. We have a board. So the transitional committee is going to determine what do they need first. Do they begin with staff or do they begin with operations or what do they begin with? That will wait to be advised by the transitional committee. On systems, Waziri, I've just heard you say we've been working with these people. Who are these people? I thought you were talking about procurement processes that are still to take place. Yes, I have told you that we are not getting a customized system. We have been looking generally at systems that are running. We have, uh, personally, I have traveled looking at systems all over the world for countries that already have achieved universal health coverage. And we have talked to more than five countries. But Waziri, it'll still need to go through the procurement process. Yes, it will. And it'll still need to be made fit for purpose for Kenya, even though you are um, you know, getting it from, from another country, another system, um, a different culture. Mm -hmm. That may take some time, or do you anticipate that that would be ready in roughly slightly over a month? It should be ready. We are promising 1st of March because we know that it will be ready. I've said they're not building from scratch. These are customized systems. They're already working in their different countries. So whatever they're coming to do here is just... a customized system. Is it a customized system or not? Sorry, I'm just... Maybe I'm getting mixed up. Okay. We are not, doing, we are not building a system for sure. We are going for systems that are already working. So there'll be very small customization in terms of country needs and all that. But otherwise, these are systems that are already working. We have talked to several countries, five of them so far. Yeah. You want to mention the countries? No, no, no. I do not want to mention. You, you, you see, Waziri, <laughs> I'm a bit confused. Procurement has not happened, mm -hmm. but you've already identified the systems that will come. Before you do a procurement process, yeah. you do a market sounding. What is a market sounding? Checking what is there. So that even when you develop your specs for procurement, you are developing for things that you know are there. You don't buy from, from, from nowhere. It's not an abstract, you know. Okay. I'm no expert, but I thought you started from needs assessment. But anyway, yeah. let's talk about um, as soon as this comes. A system is good. Not much of customization needed. But if, this, if the people who are using the system cannot use it, it can't run. Mm. So True. there has to be a lot of training, training. not just that 
SHA, that is the Social Health Authority, but also in the facilities, it's, these are the hospitals. If there's any intervention by the patient, they also have to know how it works. So then, do you think much is realistic, or are you saying that you want to start collecting the money as you organize yourself? <laughs> I think you're trying to corner me some. No, I'm not. There are things that we are going to do within this period of time. Yeah, we may be, opt maybe I'm just uh, running to ensure that Kenyans access healthcare. Maybe. And healthcare is a service. And healthcare is a service, which should be provided. You cannot postpone getting sick, can you? You can't. So it's to try and see how much we can deliver within the time that we have been given. Just like the way people are asking, how are we able to deliver the, the acts within such a period of time? We know of acts that have taken forever to be finalized. But when you are determined and focused, when you have clarity on that that you need to do, and you know how to do it, then you get to move. Okay, you see, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it's up to uh, the ministry and mm -hmm. the authority to decide. But don't you risk moving so fast, yet we have seen most of the systems in this country, there are always challenges, even if, when it comes to elections, despite a lot of piloting. Don't you want to spend some time to see how the system works, the piloting itself, because it's, it's an entire phase to roll out a system. And why the rush in the first place? We are not rushing. We want to provide care for Kenyans. So there's no rush in that. As I have told you, I may be fine right now. I do not know about tomorrow. I may be sick. I will need care. So we are working efficiently. I think one thing that government, uh, that Kenyans now must appreciate that is that this government is efficient. That must be appreciated. Okay. You know, we are used to that government projects must take forever. Number two, would you fear to set up a system because it will fail? No. I it doesn't make sense. So set up the system. Whatever challenges crop up, see how you mitigate, see how you take care of them. And we have a risk plan for all this that we are planning to do. So that if anything arises, then we are able to mitigate. But we are not going to sit back and say, since systems fail, so we are not going to have a system that will be responsible okay. of us. Okay. Um, of course, there are phases of implementation mm -hmm. of systems. Uh, again, piloting, testing, customization, training, and everything. Um, but... Would you know how much you're targeting to collect through the Social Health Insurance Fund contributions? Yes. Uh, we have uh, actuaries. They've worked on the numbers. And our target is based on what previously we have provided at each level of service. For the tertiary service, we expect to collect about $46 billion because that, was, uh, that is the range that we are spending currently on uh, tertiary services. Then on uh, secondary service, we expect to collect about $140 billion, which is also equivalent to the uh, service that we have provided. And then for the primary, uh, that is level one, two, up to three, is a projection of about $80 billion. So that's turn, how much is that? 266 billion shillings? Yes, there are about. How much are you collecting currently under NHF? Very minimal. From uh, payroll, we are collecting uh, 35 billion. From uh, the informal, it is a uh, haphazard. Uh, many months, you <coughs> collect very little. Other months, you collect some more. But I think the highest that we have uh, collected from the informal is about, uh, I'm not quite sure of the figure, but not more than 50 billion. Not more than 50 billion? Yeah. And would you know how much you're targeting from payroll into the new system? Yes. Payroll, we target to collect uh, 100%, which is 42 billion. 42 billion. Yes. So 224 billion shillings is supposed to come from the non-payroll side. Yes. That's quite an assignment. Live alone non-payroll side. Again, remember in uh, health, we have... Uh, a lot of donor-supported programs. And these programs mostly support the low-level facilities. So there's, I think, 101 billion mm -hmm. that we get from uh, donor support. Donor support. These yes. are contributions now to the Social Health Insurance Fund? They, they, they put to the services directly. For example, HIV. It is 100% donor supported in terms of running the clinics, okay. in terms of the drugs. So, so this 66 billion shillings is not just about contributions? Not just about contributions. So we have some donor contributions? Support. I'll have to work that out some. Okay. Yeah. Mm. All right. Yvonne? Um, I think 
for me, it's to thank you for coming uh, and for being with us tonight. Um, we will, and, and thank you for always, uh, you know, agreeing to come <laughs> on our various platforms here mm -hmm. on uh, Royal Media Services. And it is because there is such great uh, uh, interest in, in matters held, obviously, uh, for every citizen of the country. And that we will continue to have this conversation until such time as the public participation exercise is done and even beyond. Uh, and we thank you for always coming and answering the questions. And for just tonight, Waziri, being a gangster, <laughs> Once the clock strikes 12, you can go back to being... <laughs> <laughs> Once a gangster, always, always a gangster. Is that so? Yeah. That yeah. Is so. <laughs> so it is. Thank you so, so much thank you. Coming. Thank you for providing the platform. Yeah. And uh, mine is that you don't just provide the platform for me, but to <clears throat> equally to my other uh, members of staff at the Ministry of Health, because many Kenyans, uh, Kenyans have questions. Mm. And it is now this opportunity that we use to give as much information as possible so that even when they come to the public participation, they participate meaningfully mm. because they have some information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Thank you. It is good to see you again. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think I'm going to take some time. As you, <laughs> as you leave, there will be a badge waiting for you. Um, <laughs> the person who decides those things is seated at this table. So that decision will be made. <laughs> <laughs> please uh, hold on one minute. Let's take a short break here on Newsgang. When we come back, it's our joint final word. Stay with us. This is Newsgang.